Section 1. You will hear a conversation between Annetta and Charlotte, first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part-time work. Now. I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes. J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414847748. I'll just check. No, sorry, not 748. It's 749. 0414 Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. But I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK. Well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 11. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays. But they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick, so they couldn't get to the bank. But they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence. But I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? 
Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3 p.m. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now. Four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then... Walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of Section 1. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a radio program about sport. First, look at questions 11 to 14. For these questions, listen carefully and circle the correct letters. And now for our Mystery Personality of the Week and your chance to win one of our fabulous prizes. Last week's competition generated a huge response and the first five answers pulled out of the bag will receive a hundred pounds worth of sports clothes vouchers. And if you didn't win last week, here's another chance. And this week's prize is even bigger. We're giving away ten prizes of £250 worth of book, music and clothes vouchers to mark the first anniversary of the show on the air. So get your pens ready to take down the address details. Just write the name of the person you think is our mystery personality and send it to Mystery Draw at the address Marcia will give you in just a second. The address will be repeated at the end of the show for those of you who didn't get it. And so it's over to Marcia, who will tell you a few tantalising details about our mystery person this week. Thanks, Mike. Well, here goes. Our mystery person this week is a very well-known footballer who plays for a famous club and has also played for his national team. He is very talented and is enormously popular especially for the part he played in a famous footballing victory. And two clues. He hasn't got a famous wife. And he speaks French. If you think you know who it is, then pop the answer on a postcard and send it to Mystery Draw, P.O. Box 5110, London SE1 5LE. That's P.O. Box 5110. And please don't forget to write your name and address too. And now it's back to Mike. 
Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. As you listen to the second part of the sports program, answer questions fifteen to twenty. Circle the correct letter. Thank you, Marcia. Get those postcards in and make this a bumper anniversary draw. Now. If you remember, last week on the show, we talked to the organizer of a new group set up to help young people up to the age of twenty to get involved in activities like horse riding, tennis, scuba diving, cycling, or any form of sport which involves some kind of expense. John Tebbit, the organizer, rang us to say that the response to his appeal on the show was staggering. A large number of people, both young and old, have offered their services free as volunteers. The whole thing has been overwhelming. John said that they had also had numerous offers of help throughout the country to use facilities free of charge. As if that was not enough, they have received many donations, including several rather large gifts of more than five thousand pounds. On behalf of John Tebbit and also of those who will benefit from the generous gifts to the trust, I would like to say thank you. This week we're going to talk to a very unusual athlete indeed. Patrick, who is twenty years of age, has been wheelchair bound for the past five years after a motorcycle accident left him paralysed from the waist down. This has not stopped this young man from getting out and about. He's an inspiration to all of us. Patrick has excelled in archery, beating the best in the field. So much so that he has won sponsorship from leading sports manufacturers, which has now enabled him to devote more time to perfecting his skills. So I would like to introduce you to Patrick, who is going to tell us what this sponsorship means to him. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Hear a conversation between a research student, Jeremy, and his supervisor. They are talking about the process of having a research project published in a journal. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So you're nearly ready to submit your article to an academic journal, are you? Yes, I think so. I just wanted to go over all the things I need to do before I submit it, and then I wanted to go over the submission process with you. Great. So, firstly, you need to write an abstract. Make sure it's short and concise. Of course, I forgot all about that. 
And what about key words? <laughs> yes, a lot of students overlook this part and just jot down whatever comes to mind. But take some time to make a list of key words that are accurate and relevant. Okay. Another thing, could you have a look at my article before I submit it? Absolutely. Actually, at least two senior staff members should always read through a final draft before submission. Do you mind if I give it to Professor Johnson to have a look at as well? Not at all. I'd be glad to have the feedback. Do you know which journal you want to submit to yet? Not yet. I have a short list of about three that I'm interested in. Make that decision soon, because you'll need to adjust your article so that it matches the style guide of the journal you are submitting to. I bet that can take a while. Yes, but after that you are just about ready to submit. One more thing, you'll have to sign the copyright form, just confirming that it's your own work, and then you're good to go. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, the submission process, how does it work exactly? Well, the first thing is to just send it off. You've got to send in the manuscript before anything else can happen. Sure. And then should I call to check if they have received it? No need for that, no. All you have to do is just log on to your email regularly because you will get a submission confirmation once they have processed the manuscript. And that will have comments on what they thought of it? No, no comments yet. That email is just to let you know they have received it. The next stage is what is known as peer review. This is when experts in the field review your manuscript and decide whether to accept it. Ah, they'll never accept me. I'm only a master's student. Don't worry about that, Jeremy. It's all done through a double-blind method. That means that whoever reads your manuscript has no idea whether you are a grad student or a Nobel Prize laureate. They'll only be judging your work, not you. Well, that's good to hear. And then what? once they've made their decision? Well, there are four possible outcomes. You might get an acceptance, but a first-off acceptance is very, very rare. Don't pin your hopes on it. You could also get a rejection, but these don't happen very often either. I don't think this will be a problem. What do you think I'll get? <laughs> if you're very lucky, you'll get a conditional acceptance. This means that they've accepted the article and it will be published, but you need to tweak a few things first. A sentence here, a heading there, nothing major. That sounds good. But to be honest, you will probably end up with a revise and resubmit. This means they are definitely interested, but you will need to rework the paper before it's accepted. The necessary changes will be outlined by the reviewers. Okay. So I just fix the things that need changing and present it again? Yes, but include a cover letter that discusses the changes you have made. The same goes for a conditional acceptance, actually. It helps the reviewers see that you've taken their criticism seriously. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35.
Okay, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers, as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins when people get in from work are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news. Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now, technological changes, which have fueled the rise of online news, have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer, in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, Newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. 
As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full page ads. So, what I would like to move on to. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs> Thank you.